Yes. We've been looking for light brown apple moss in Fairfax for months, and we can't find one. So, you know, just, just at the time, we thought, well, we beat those buggers. They're back. And um, uh, they're back in full force. And they're spending money. And uh, their goal is to eradicate this moth that's done no damage in California whatsoever. None. And they're going to spend whatever it takes to do that. They've started a $3 million scare public relations campaign that they're running on television and radio. Uh, they're talking about this invasive pest that's attacking everything from our redwood trees to, uh, uh, to, 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 our, uh, to our ornamental trees and shrubs in our yards, to our vegetables and our fruits that we grow here in California with such abundance. They said, you know, the CDFA tells us they're going to destroy every crop in California. And so, and so th their program's coming. Uh, those moths are about to, to, to I guess, I guess the, the moths that down in, or um, um, well, where they grow those moths, they've got them in some warehouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that Moss Landing? Moss Landing. Moss Landing. Moss Landing. Yeah, they're growing those moths. And they want to dump them, you know. The, the, they want to initiate the program on the, Mar on, I'm sorry, on the Sonoma Napa border, the Canaris region, where they grow fine grapes. And they say they have to do this because if they don't, the people up there will be spraying terrible pesticides and, uh, and they're going to save us from the terrible pesticides all the yeah. private property owners and, and agriculturalists are going to spray, the farmers are going to spray. Uh, they want to dump the numbers. It was like 1,400 moths per acre um, and it's going to be uh, once a week for 27 weeks and there's 3,000 acres where they're going to be dumping these moths and we calculated it out. It's like 100 and 14 million moths they're going to put on the Sonoma Napa border. They're going to create such a massive problem up there uh, that I, I don't know what they're going to do to correct it. I mean, then, then they're going to say we have to come in and spray now because the, we've created this this terrible this terrible terrible uh, mess. Um, the moths are just everywhere. They're just everywhere. The reason we're doing this today is to raise money, and all the funds go to the law, Volker Law Firm. Uh, in order to challenge these guys in court, we're not we're not stand we're not going to put up with it. We're not going to stand still for them. Yay. And so they need to know we're, we're on it. We need to get get our our our, our, our main group of, of speakers up here, and we've got from from the San Francisco Board of Supervisors um, a person that I met. I met on the steps of City Hall last year. We were fighting Alabama in San Francisco, and and. Uh, um, uh, you know, we we're coming over from Marin. Folks are coming over from Santa Cruz and Monterey, and and we got to stop the spray, San Francisco. We're just getting them going. And Michelle Darby and a whole group in the city, and and uh, we met in the steps. A bunch of moms from San Francisco said we're not going to be sprayed in San Francisco, and and the state said, San Francisco, we'll spray San Francisco just like we sprayed Santa Cruz and Monterey. Boy, was that a big mistake on their part. Uh, so that's why I first met Ross, and uh, Ross jumped right in the middle of the fray. What's great about Ross today is he's got a new job. He's got a new vocation. He is the new Coastal Commissioner representing San Francisco, Marin County, and Sonoma County. So, so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we, we have a twofer here. We have a twofer. By golly, the coastal, the coastal zone and coastal resources are being adversely impacted by pesticides and by this spray. And and we know when this gets before the Coastal Commission, we're going to have an advocate on our side. You know, we can't tell him how to vote because that, that, that's his prerogative. But if you just look at his history, you know, he's going to do the right thing. So, Ross, do you want to come on up? And we'll start with a, with a, with a, with a couple of words here. We'll let you tell you just just you can tell us just a little about what you're doing here in the Coastal Commission and and, and the spray stuff and, and then we're going to get Joni Gregans up here. Oh, Joni's with us from KGO. Yay, and Johnny. then in the end, we're going to bring on the big gun, the guy who you know if they persist is going to take them down in court. That's yeah. Stephen Volker. Oh, yeah. Okay. Come on. Hi. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Frank and Renita for, for some time now. They've been asking me to uh, let's get to know each other. And it's really nice to, uh, it's actually very delightful getting to know 
many of you in person because I've heard of many of you, but we just haven't met. And being on the Coastal Commission has now extended my perch a bit uh, statewide, but certainly in this region uh, we, where we as sensible revolutionaries could uh, really, uh, I think, stitch together our know-how. And I think that that know-how was well demonstrated with the uh, LBAM fight. And uh, Frank is quite right. When they proposed to do this in San Francisco, uh, we made it clear that this was unacceptable and it would not be tolerated no matter what their junk science would say. So they hit a buzzsaw in San Francisco, and we didn't like the way that they were going on to other cities and other counties and trying to promote what we thought was very illogical. Um, and so everybody here, as it was well noted, should feel extremely proud uh, in their ability to uh, fend them off. But I understand that they're trying to come back again, and they're trying to repackage their science and their justification for spring. So that just means we're going to have to ratchet up, I think, our response. Uh, and by the looks of everybody here who is, uh, you know, veterans of this fight and who are uh, really quite skilled, I think, in mobilizing the grassroots, I'm confident we'll be able to bat them back. Mm -hmm. And I feel that way also about the Coastal Commission. Uh, I'm very fortunate uh, to have been uh, appointed by the State Senate and the Coastal Commission. I had asked for my alternate to be Mayor Sarah Gurney, uh, the Mayor of Sebastopol, uh, on the Coastal Commission. And I believe that we have a good sort of bookend strategy uh, here in this part of uh, our wonderful, majestic area of California to send the right response about the level of environmentalism and sensitivity that we want to see represented in the Coastal Commission, which I have felt even long before I was on the Commission that have been somewhat lost just a little bit, and that there's enough room to kind of bring them back, I think, in our direction. Um, my first vote when I was there, just to give you some indication, I think about illogic approach, is that the Coastal Commission uh, decided to take an appeal by Southern California Edison and the Schwarzenegger administration, who was rejected by the city of Oxnards and Ventura some months ago to put a power plant right on the coast in Oxnard. Now, Oxnard is a city of about 70% Latino, uh, and it's probably one of the most heavily uh, uh, endowed Superfund sites and hazardous waste sites anywhere in California per capita of its population. Mm -hmm. It is the quintessential definition as we have grown to know what environmental racism is. But there is not really the kind of scope or statutory jurisdiction for environmental racism in the notion of the Coastal Act. And this is why Southern California Edison and the Schwarzenegger administration prevailed, even though we fought and fought hard. And it was fun to sort of be baptized at that first issue uh, and try to give bloody noses even to our most liberal colleagues to say, I'm sorry, this is just unacceptable. But it was known to me after that that we have to modernize our fight in the environmental movement. And it has to then make sure that it is uh, memorialized in all the acts that so many people here fought for in the 1970s and the 1980s. That level of upgrade has to be recognized in the state legislature and it has to be our line in the sand. It's almost absurd that in the commission what will come before us in the near future is the question of offshore oil drilling. Who would have thought after so much that it had been accomplished, especially from before then Senator Boxer and everybody with her, we would be returning to this particular issue and this issue and appeal could actually come back to us. Who would have thought that Governor Schwarzenegger, who seems to really rest in the laurels of helping push AB 32 as him being sort of in touch with the environment, on the other hand, will be pushing for a peak or power plant on the California coast where we haven't had one in 40 years. I worry about the schlock environmentalism that is now proliferating in different areas just to pacify those who feel like we're on top of it. And I don't feel like we're on top of it. I don't feel like the federal government has got its hands around it. I don't like the glacial pace in which it's moving. And the state government right now seems to be not as, I think, uh, vigorous in their attempt to really answer these questions. So the responsibility deflects to the local and municipal governments, no matter big or small. And that's why Delight is a county supervisor in San Francisco and now as a coastal commissioner to unite with people like yourselves to make sure that our voices get heard and that we realize that it's from a municipality, I think, strategy that we begin to really mobilize upward and tell the state and the feds 
we are setting the ante as to what is acceptable and what is not. I think LBAM was a perfect example of this. What we hope to do in the commission, I think, is another example. Climate change legislation is also another example, but only if it's meaningful and only if it's held accountable. I mean, there's a lot of climate change legislation that is moving around, but if you read the stuff in terms of what the levels of enforcement or compliance are, I think it's kind of thin. Considering what the pace and considering what I think the requirements are for us to really step up to the plate. I was the guy, and I didn't even know this at the time, but I was the one who authored the ban on plastic bags in San Francisco. And I had... <clears throat> And I had no idea, I had no idea that we were the first city in the United States, frankly, the first city in the hemisphere to do this. I had no idea that we were going to do this. And the um, response that came from municipalities and states, red and blue states, by the way, who were very interested in this legislation, made it very clear that it transcended, I think, partisan politics, but it was resonating with people who were getting it getting the fact that we needed to do something from a local level and begin to do so whether in the name of economics or environmentalism or just out of pure frustration because of the paralysis and things not moving in the kind of pace that they would like in a higher level of government. Now this kind of law is proliferating. It's also now getting blunted back by the petrochemical industry and by the grocer industry. And now we've engaged in many cities to uh, and join on an EIR so that statewide we'll move for a plastic bag ban and hit them right. backwards so that we'll use our science through an EIR, which they demanded we do, which is absurd that banning plastic bags will have some adver adverse effect on the environment, so we have to do an EIR now. <laughs> but we'll play their game. We'll play their game. And I believe that in that game, you know, we will be able to then kneecap them in the way that we should. But again, this is, all, this is all emanating from a local level. This is all emanating from the kind of standards and the kind of values that reflect our politics, our philosophy, and our way of life. And this is why I think it's a level of sensibility that begins to, I think, uh, proliferate in a very reasonable and a measured way. And that's why I think it's great in this day of age, but it's also disconcerting that we feel like we're at a juncture point where we can go in the direction that really innovates the kind of environmentalism that we would really like, or we can go backwards and let the facade of environmentalism take over for us. I think it's the former we want. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Anyone have a question? We don't get lost over here very often. Anyone have any questions? How you see the uh, kind of the political configuration of the coastal commission vis-a-vis -vis protecting our coast and and my understanding originally that is that the coastal commission was was pretty vigorous and pretty hardcore when it came to protecting coastal values and my impression is that over the course of the last decade or, or more it's softened up and if it's appropriate for you to comment on that it would be great but just before Ross speaks, let me just say, I spent nine years on the original Coastal Commission, and, 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 and we were tough. We were tough. We, you know, we had a kick-ass reputation, and, and uh, uh, we shut a lot of projects down. Now, what we don't want to do is put Ross in a position of having to speak to how some of his other commissioners are, see the issues or how they're voting or not voting. Uh, I just, so if, I can if, give if it. you can talk you can generally, yeah. if you can't, that's fine. I'm yeah. just yeah. very curious. No, I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty candid person. Um, well, the commission itself, for people who don't know, it's, it's got to be one of the most powerful land use bodies in the United States, no question about it. In fact, just being on the commission, one of the newest members, I'm literally shocked uh, in some ways just how powerful we are. Mm. We can supersede CEQA. Uh, we trump really any particular law uh, with maybe the exception of the Wilderness Act. And in that regard, um, the composition of the commission is 12 members, four picked by the assembly, four picked by the governor, four picked by the state senate. I, we are from the state senate side. If you look at the environmental organizations like um, the League of Conservation Voters, the Sierra Club and others, EDF, who track this stuff on the scorecards, of how the commissioners have done, you will see probably over the last 10 years, eight to 10 years or so, a shift to the right. right. Even though there have been long-standing battles and well-fought battles um, by both staff of the Coastal Commission, 
who has felt more beleaguered over the years. And Peter Douglas is an amazing man. He's a hero of the movement who started this, the executive director. But there is a level of fatigue that has to, of course, set in by the constant attacks that right. really sort of diminish the power of the commission and their resources. And so when I was a, um, being nominated or considered for nomination, it didn't surprise me that you had organizations like the Pacific Legal Foundation and other well-known, um, prominent uh, lobbyists and foundations on behalf of developers and others who just went after me hardcore. I mean, before I was even uh, solidified by the state senate, they just had like these poster campaigns, like, oh my god, you know, the apocalypse is coming with Mercury. But, you know, it, it, it was through that level of tone and tenor. But, you know, I, I gotta tell you something, and, and Sarah could affirm this and others have been watching it. It's shifting now back in the direction. If you look at key votes that have been taking place, I'm not kidding. We're drawing those lines in the sand. They went too soft in the other direction, even those who are more well known on these positions. And it's time to bring them back because this is the message we have to send. When you were speaking, Ross, you were pretty confident that we could successfully organize this time around to stop the spray. I spoke to some other people who were not so confident. Do you, uh, do you have any sense of what the keys are to organizing this time around? Well, I'm trying to be inspiring, if anything. Um, <laughs> it, 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 and, <laughs> and yet, I'm, I'm also putting, I think, the challenge out there, since the foundation has been set by the strong organization that has been stitched together amongst the Bay Area <laughs> counties and outside, that by having, and by having, I think, a captive audience of elected officials and those who seek elected office, um, we should be considered, uh, you know, almost part of that first line of defense, and then we grow from there. Um, I think elected officials have got to be pinned down, and the city councils and county governments immediately on this issue. We've taken an issue in San Francisco, ordinance resolution backs us up, I had authored resolution legislation that requires the city attorney to pony up dollars and get ready for litigation in the first fight. I think that is the stretch. When you go to city and county governments, require legislation not to just symbolically say no, but literally pony up the muscle that says we want to attach city attorney or uh, sort of civic dollars attached for legal representation in order to fight and litigate against this. And they can do this in an enjoyment between city governments. The resolutions that were going around did not have that component. A lot of them were, we just don't want the spray, don't do it in our backyard here. It's the question of litigation that should be part of the legislation. Yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent. I think we've got a good coastal commissioner here. <laughs> We're going to do well. Marin County is going to do well. San Francisco is going to do well. And Sonoma is going to do well.